Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jacob Steele, Events Coordinator for Banyan Books and Sound. So today, Steve Taylor will share wisdom and practices from his book, The Clear Light, Spiritual Reflections and Meditations. He also has another new book coming out in September titled Extraordinary Awakenings, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. And he might share a bit from that too. Steve Taylor, PhD, is the author of many best-selling books on spirituality and psychology, including The Leap and The Calm Center. For the last six years, Steve Taylor has been included in Mind, Body, Spirit magazine's list of the 100 most spiritually influential living people. He's a lecturer and researcher in psychology at Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom. And uh, I'll just read you a quote from Eckhart Tolle um, about his new book, um, The Clear Light. If you read this book slowly, attentively, and repeatedly, it can take you beyond identification with the content of your mind and into the clear light of present moment awareness. So it's a real honor to welcome you here today, Steve Taylor. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. So good, good, oh, should I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. I think if, if you are in Canada, it's good morning. If you are in the US, maybe good afternoon. If you are in England, where I am, it's good evening. And in this, um, in this session, I'm going to read a few pieces from my book, The, uh, the Clear Light. And... I'm also going to lead you through a couple of meditative exercises based on the pieces. All of the pieces in the book, um, I I sometimes call them poems. I'm never really sure whether to call them poems or pieces or reflections or contemplations. Sometimes people say to me, "Mm, this isn't poetry. It doesn't rhyme. It doesn't have a regular meter and so forth. But it's it's definitely uh, poetic. But um, whatever it is, they seem these pieces seem to come through me spontaneously. Uh, usually when my mind is fairly quiet and I'm fairly relaxed and I'm not particularly busy in my life, some inspiration flows through me and it takes the form of a, a poetic piece. And this is a collection of some of the pieces which have flowed through me. And most of them illustrate particular insights or qualities of spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. So it's quite natural to ally them to meditations or contemplations because that's where they arise from. In fact, I'd like to begin with a piece, a poetic piece, which I often use to begin sessions because it's, an, it's a great way of emptying our minds and meeting one another in a state of emptiness and openness. Often, when we meet people for the first time, we carry with us, well, not for the first time, when we meet people, even if we meet people regularly, we carry expectations, we carry intentions, we carry insecurities, uh, prejudices, preconceptions, and so on. We carry lots of things into meetings with one another, uh, even towards people who are, who are very familiar to us. But ideally, when we meet another person, we should let go of all of these baggages, all of these expectations and intentions, and meet people purely 
in presence, purely in a state of openness. And that's when we can really connect with one another. And what I'm going to do from this point onwards, I'm going to use the poems or poetic pieces to illustrate certain spiritual qualities. So I guess you could say that this piece illustrates the spiritual quality of presence. And later we will deal with or introduce other spiritual qualities like acceptance uh, and gratitude. But let's begin with presence. This is about being present to one another. <clears throat> and it's called, as I say, it's called meeting purely in presence. Let's meet without pretense, without hierarchies of status or artificial shows of respect, without trying to impress each other with our knowledge or charm or humor. Let's meet without fear of exposing our vulnerabilities, without being embarrassed by our need for love or pretending to be self-sufficient. Let's meet without the past, without letting our urge to connect be obstructed by old resentments, without letting our natural empathy be blocked by hard, fixed prejudice. Let's meet without insecurity, knowing we don't have to prove that we're worthy of each other's affection, since love doesn't need to be earned or gained, but simply allowed to flow. Let's meet without intentions, without any designs or goals, knowing we don't have to try to relate to each other because we're already related, knowing that there's nothing we need to do except to allow, allow ourselves to be. Let's meet purely in presence, without any conditions or concepts, knowing that in essence we are the same, and that in being, we are one. So maybe we can do that now. Maybe we can meet each other purely in presence now. Wherever you are, even despite all the, the distance between us, wherever we are in the world, maybe we can connect with one another and open our beings to one another. Let's, um, let's close our eyes for a moment in a brief meditation. Let's close our eyes and just bring your attention inward into your mental space. Be aware of your body too. For a moment, just be aware of the places where your body meets the hard surface of the floor or the chair you're sitting on. Be aware of the clothes resting against your body. And now bring your attention within. Feel the energy of your inner body, bring your attention higher up to your mental space. And if there are any thoughts or associations passing through your mind, just allow them to flow by without attaching yourself to them. And just locate yourself within your mental space, just watching any thoughts or associations pass by. And be aware of the, the space between you and your thoughts. Be aware of the, the spacious energy around you, within you.
maybe you can sense that this energy has a, quali a quality of radiance, a dynamic quality, even a quality of natural well-being. And if you can still sense thoughts passing by, just allow them to keep flowing, being aware of the space between you and those thoughts. Maybe you can sense that the space is growing larger. Maybe you can sense that you are expanding within, that your inner space is expanding. And as you feel your inner space expanding, maybe you can sense an openness within you, an emptiness, beyond thought, beneath thought, a space where there are no ideas, no preconceptions, no intentions, a space that consists purely of presence. Maybe you can also sense that this space seems to expand outside you. Somehow this space is beyond the physical. It transcends the physical stuff of your body. And it connects you to other people and other living beings. So just for a moment, within that space, let's connect to each other, to everybody who has joined the session, or everybody who is listening to the recording. Let's connect across time and space within that openness, without any concepts or intentions. Let's just feel that connection between us in our shared consciousness. And now let's slowly gently open our eyes again and bring that little exercise to a close. Presence is probably the, the most essential and fundamental quality of spiritual development or spiritual awakening. But often it's forgotten that presence is incredibly important in relationships too. If you are not present in relationships, then there will be discord in those relationships. You know, if you are with your partner and they're telling you about their problems, but secretly you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight or what's going to happen tomorrow, or maybe you're even quietly watching the TV in the corner of your eye, then even if just subconsciously your partner will sense that they're being disrespected because you're not paying attention to them and it will create discord in the relationship. But if you are present, if you meet them purely in presence, then it will have the opposite effect. It will bring harmony into the relationship. It can heal, presence can heal relationships which are broken by discord. Now, um, I'd like to read another piece about acceptance, which is another fundamental and essential spiritual quality. 
I've always been um, very aware of the power of acceptance, particularly in my own life, because, um, well, the first time I was really aware of the power of the, of the power of acceptance was about 20 years ago when I started to have tinnitus. Well, when I was young, I was a musician playing in loud rock bands. I was a bass guitarist and I used to sing sometimes, but we always had incredibly loud drummers who I suspect damaged my hearing and created tinnitus in my ear. But it started about 20 years ago and at first it drove me crazy. It was very disturbing because I could never experience silence again. There was constantly this shrieking noise, this whistling, screaming sound in my ear. And for about 18 months, it made my life quite miserable because I was continually fighting against it. I was going to the hospital, trying out different treatments. I was trying methods of masking the noise. I would tune the radio to white noise when I went to bed, which wasn't very nice for my wife. But after about 18 months, I realized that I had no choice but to accept. I realized that the tinnitus was not going to go away and it's never going to work. I can hear it right now in my left ear as we speak. But I realized after 18 months that I had to try to accept it. So one night I didn't turn the radio on. I just put my head down on the pillow and I said, okay, I'm going to accept the noise. I'm going to go towards the noise. I'm going to go into it rather than trying to fight it, rather than trying to resist it. So I put my head on the pillow and at first the noise was terrible. It was a shrieking, screaming noise that seemed to overwhelm me. But I went into it. I allowed my attention to move towards it, to merge with it. And slowly I thought, wow, yeah, it's, it's not wonderful, but you know, if I accept it, if I go into it, it's not as disturbing. And after a few days, it, there was a remarkable transformation. The noise just stopped disturbing me because I accepted it, because I allowed it to become part of my reality rather than resisting it. And ever since then, you know, um, the tinnitus has never, never bothered me. I'm still careful. I still, um, you know, carry earplugs around in case noise gets very loud. But since then, due to the power of acceptance, I have never been disturbed by it. And the power of acceptance is also very, a, a very important factor in my latest book, Extraordinary Awakenings, because Extraordinary Awakenings is about the power of, um, well, it's about the remarkable transformation that can occur in the midst of intense psychological turmoil. So I spoke to many people who had been through incredibly difficult circumstances, crises and challenges and problems in their lives. Uh, so I spoke to people who'd been in the midst of severe addiction, people who had been broken down by bereavement, by diagnosis of cancer. I spoke to several prisoners who'd un undergone this experience. I spoke to some soldiers who'd undergone this experience. And in the midst of intense stress and intense turmoil or depression, some people undergo a remarkable transformation an extraordinary awakening and i found in my research that this transformation often occurred in a moment of acceptance it was often triggered by a moment of acceptance it was a moment when an alcoholic handed over his problem it, it was a moment when people were so depressed that they, they decided to just give up, to surrender. It was a moment when people who were, who'd undergone accidents or medical emergencies stopped fighting against their predicaments and just let go or surrendered. So in that sense, acceptance has this tr tremendous transformational power. So let me read a piece called um, The Alchemy of Acceptance. Then I'll lead you through a, a short contemplative exercise about acceptance. So this is The Alchemy of Acceptance, part one. Emptiness can be a vacuum, cold and hostile, dark with danger. Or emptiness 
can be radiant space, glowing with soft stillness. And the only difference between them is acceptance. A task may seem tedious, a chore to rush through reluctantly, or a task may seem rewarding, a process to relish with an attentive mind that reveals more richness the more present we become. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Pain may seem unbearable, searing through you from a sharp concentrated point so that you have no choice but to resist, to try to escape, to push away the pain. Or pain can be a sensation that you can move towards and merge with that no longer has a center and dissipates through your being until it becomes soft and numb, no longer pain at all. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Trauma can break you down to nothing, destroy the identity you spent your whole life building up, like an earthquake that leaves you in ruins. Or trauma can transform you, break open new depths and heights of you, give rise to a greater structure, a miraculous new self. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Life can be frustrating and full of obstacles with desires for a different life constantly disturbing your mind. Or life can be fulfilling, full of opportunities with a constant flow of gratitude for the gifts you have. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Let's contemplate that now and let's maybe practice the alchemy of acceptance. I'd like you to, again, maybe close your eyes for a moment. You don't have to close your eyes, but maybe it will help if you do. And I'm going to lead you through a, a, a visualization exercise for a moment. So let's close our eyes and return to our inner space. Just feel the radiance, the radiance of your inner space again, that dynamic energy and that sense of well-being within you. And I'd like you to contemplate your life for a moment. Life consists of many different aspects. There are our daily lives consisting of our, the tasks and chores and responsibilities of our day-to-day -day lives, maybe involving our children, the people we care for, the tasks that we have to do as a part of our jobs, the people we meet on a daily basis, the chores we do in our houses, that's part of life. Also, there is our physical bodies, that's part of our lives. Maybe some of you have certain issues, certain physical issues. Also, from a wider perspective, there is our life situation, that's the place where we live, the career or job that we have, the profession we have, the people we are in relationships with. Maybe you have an idea of where you would like to go in the future and so forth. Maybe you have a sense of where you've been in the past. And then there are certain fundamental aspects of life such as the aging process and such as 
mortality, such as our death. Eventually, we were born, we go through this process of physically and spiritually and intellectually and creatively growing, and eventually, we move towards the end of our physical existence. So all of those are aspects of life. What I'd like you to do is to imagine that there is a landscape in front of you. Imagine that you are sitting or standing on the side of a, a mountain and there is a landscape beneath you, around you. You can survey the whole of this landscape and the landscape is your life. It's every situation that constitutes your life, every aspect of your life, every person, every task, every process that you go through in your life. It's all just there in front of you, around you. Your past is there, your future is there, and your present life is there too. And as you survey this landscape maybe there are a certain maybe there are certain aspects of life where you feel some resistance certain aspects of your life which you find it difficult to accept maybe it's to do with those day-to-day -day chores of your life the people maybe it's your something about your job Maybe it's something about your life situation, the place where you're living, the people you're living with, the circumstances in your family, and so on. Or maybe it's something within your body, some condition or issue with your physical being that causes some resistance. Or maybe it's something about life itself. Maybe it's the aging process. Maybe even the fact of your mortality, the fact that at some point we are going to face the end of our physical existence, we are going to face death. Maybe you find that difficult to accept. So just, you know, as, I cont as you contemplate those areas of your life, just be aware of any resistance which emerges. Just focus on any particular area of your life where you feel some resistance. And now, if you can just remain aware of that resistance, I'd like you to just make a mental intention to release that resistance. You can almost imagine that there is a cord or string which connects you to that particular aspect of your life. And that cord causes tension, but maybe you can just allow yourself to let go, to release that cord. Maybe even if you breathe out, as you breathe out, you just let go of your resistance and the cord breaks away, fades away, melts away. And as you let go of your resistance, as the cord melts away, you feel a sense of release and openness. Let's do that again. Just breathe in. And as you breathe out, just let go of your resistance. You can do that as many times as you like. Just breathe in and let go of your resistance. Feeling a sense of openness, release, as if the tension is dissolving. And as you survey the landscape of your life, every aspect of your life, just open yourself, just embrace the whole of that landscape. Accept it all as it is. It doesn't, mean that there are, it doesn't mean that you don't need to change some aspects of your life. Maybe you do need to alter certain conditions in your life. Maybe you need to enhance your life in some way. 
But acceptance can be the beginning of real change. Once you accept your whole life as it is, you get a real sense of, you become intensely aware of certain areas where you do need to alter your conditions. But that begins with acceptance. So finally, just as you survey the landscape of your life, just feel a sense of openness and acceptance. And as you feel that sense of acceptance and openness, I'll read the second part of the Alchemy of Acceptance poem, which deals with fundamental realities of life. Old age may be a process of decay that withers your body and mind and poisons you with bitterness as you yearn for the freshness of youth. Or old age may be a process of liberation that enriches you with wisdom and makes you more present as the future recedes and lightens your soul as you let go of attachments. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Death may be a cold black emptiness that mercilessly devours your ego and makes everything you own seem worthless and everything you've done seem meaningless. Or death may be a perfect culmination, a soft twilight at the end of a long summer's day when you're filled with heavy tiredness and ready to sleep and know that you will wake up again to a bright new dawn. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Now, let's, let me draw your attention to another spiritual quality. This is a, a quality which arises naturally in spiritual development or in spiritual awakening. In, my, uh, in the research in my book, Extraordinary Awakenings, one of the, uh, the common themes I found amongst the people who'd undergone Extraordinary Awakenings is that they felt an intense sense of gratitude for everything. They felt, great, they felt grateful for the health of their bodies. They felt grateful for the people in their lives. They were grateful for life itself. Many of them had had encounters with death, close brushes with death, and they had returned with this tremendous sense of gratitude for life itself, for being in the world, for the privilege of being aware of the world around them, for the simple, basic pleasures in life. And I think all of this teaches us that we do take a lot of things for granted until those things are taken away or until we have a spiritual awakening. And then all of the things we used to take for granted become incredibly precious. That includes people. We often take people for granted, members of our family, friends we've known for years, familiarity hides their beauty to us and we take them for granted we subtly disrespect them by taking them for granted but when we become spiritually awakened or have a close brush with mortality we become aware of how well in a sense we become aware of how fragile and precious our own existence is and we become aware of how fragile and precious other people's existence is too and what a gift it is to have those people in our lives so let me read a, a little poem about gratitude. This is a, it's a meditative poem, really. It's a meditation. So maybe I might read it twice. And the second time I read it, 
we'll treat it as a meditation. We'll just go through the, um, the advice or guidance which is expressed in the poem. So this is simply called The Gift. As you breathe, inhale deeply in gratitude for the gift of air. As you eat, swallow slowly in gratitude for the gift of food. As you see, look attentively in gratitude for the wonder of the world. As you love, be passionate in gratitude for the beauty of flesh and form. As you live, be authentic and fearless in gratitude for the gift of life. So let's, um, let's practice at least a couple of those things now. Let's look at the first verse again. As you breathe, inhale deeply in gratitude for the gift of air. This is a very simple gratitude meditation. Just as you breathe in the air, just feel the privilege or feel the gratitude for all of the all of the aspects, the constituents of the air that bring health and life to your body. Just feel grateful for how the air brings oxygen into your body, how it clears and cleans your body and sustains your life. We sometimes forget that every breath sustains our life. So feel that as you breathe in, as your body takes in the air, and as you breathe out, breathe out your gratitude back into the air. With every breath, just breathe out your gratitude. Your gratitude to the Earth's atmosphere, which sustains your life. We are breathing in elements of the Earth's atmosphere, which is sustaining our body maintaining the health of our body and sustaining our consciousness in this body. So feel that privilege of taking in the air and breathe out your gratitude. Let's try that with a few breaths. Maybe you can feel a, a warm glow of gratitude building up inside you. And the same with food. Maybe I don't expect you to have food with you now, but maybe the next time you eat, maybe for your lunch or for your evening meal in an hour or two, eat slowly and feel the same sense of gratitude for the food that you eat as you slowly swallow it. Be grateful for the food which sustains your life and your consciousness in this body. And also, as you see, as you see, look attentively in gratitude for the wonder of the world. We can do that now. We can just gently survey our surroundings, all of the objects around us, the phenomena around us. And as we survey them, Let's give them our full attention and feel a sense of gratitude for their presence, for their form. This works especially well with natural phenomena. So the next time you're outside, just gently observe the natural forms around you with full attention and feel a sense of gratitude for their beauty and for the, the wonderful experience of just being here in this world, being born in this body, 
despite all of the, the challenges and hardships of life, it's always a privilege just to be in the world and experience the beauty and richness, all of the intricacy of the world around us. So maybe you can feel that warm glow of gratitude inside you. And you can extend that glow of gratitude in any direction, in every direction, to the people in your life, to your body, and all of the intricate microscopic processes that take place in your body to sustain your life. Not just breathing, but all of the millions of microcosmic processes that help to sustain your life. You can extend, extend the gratitude to all of the people around you in your life. And now I'd like to, I'd like to finish with a piece before we move to some questions and comments, I'd like to finish with a piece called the wave, a longer poem called the wave which expresses the whole of our spiritual journey. Spiritual awakening, well, one way of looking at spiritual awakening is to see it as a journey from separation through to connection and union. We often begin spiritual development in a state of separation, maybe a state of suffering, because we live in a state of separation. But through our development or through our sudden awakening, we transcend that sense of separateness and we realize our connection to every living being, to every human being, to the world itself, to the whole of the natural world, to the whole cosmos. We realize that there is something inside us which transcends separateness, which is essentially one with all that is. So in that sense, spiritual awakening is a realization of our true nature. It's a rediscovery of something which maybe we lost, which maybe we experienced when we were young children, something that we maybe experienced before we were born, but something that we've lost and that we regain. So this is um, a poem called The Wave, which is an allegory. The ocean sighed with pleasure as the wind caressed and stroked her. And soon the wave was born. The wave felt his oneness with the ocean. He felt her as his source, as part of his own being and knew that he could never be apart from her. But soon the wave began to watch himself. He saw his own smooth and graceful motion and was mesmerized. He saw the beautiful bubbling foam that sprayed around him and was transfixed. The wave fell in love with himself. He started to believe that he was his own master, that it was his own strength that was propelling him. He believed he was directing his own flow and could change direction if he wanted. The wave forgot the ocean and saw himself as separate, a self-sufficient, sealess wave who felt proud of his power, exhilarated by his autonomy as he rolled faster and rose higher. But soon the wave looked around and saw the other waves, the ones who had, who had already peaked and crashed and were beginning to dip and disperse, and the others who, who were already dissolving and disappearing. The wave felt afraid, realizing that his form was temporary, that his speed and power would ebb away, and soon he would dissolve and disappear as well. The wave felt alone as he sensed the empty space around him and saw the distance between him and the other waves. He felt threatened by the ocean's vastness. 
now that he seemed to be separate from it. So the wave resisted and rebelled. He tried to build up more momentum, to collect more water, to roll more smoothly, to foam more spectacularly, to make himself so powerful that he would never dissolve away, to make his form so perfect that he would escape decay. But soon he realized he had no choice, that he had less control than he thought, less strength than he thought. He knew he couldn't, he, he knew he couldn't resist the flow of life and hold back time and tide. The wave stopped grasping and pushing and felt the relief of letting go, the freedom of no longer trying. After his majestic foaming rush and the glorious crescendo of his breaking, he gave himself up to his ebbing, fading flow and to the ease of his descent. And he was filled with the joy of acceptance. The wave allowed his boundaries to soften and felt his connection to every other wave and his oneness with the whole of the ocean. He felt the vast wholeness of the ocean within his own being, then as his own being. Then the wave dipped, slowed down, and began to dissipate. Quietly and serenely, without fear or resistance, he gave himself to the tide and became the ocean again, knowing he had never been anything else. Thank you. So if you have any uh, comments or questions, you can uh, ask them now. Matthias says, hi, Steve. I was very touched by your book, The Fall. Do you think that the ego explosion is equivalent to patriarchal mind and patriarchal societies? Definitely. Yeah, that's one of the ideas I try to get across in the book is that patriarchy is the result of e the ego explosion or was the result. As I suggested in the fall, original human societies were not patriarchal. They weren't matriarchal either. They were just egalitarian. There was, uh, there was gender equality and there was general equality. Original human societies were also largely peaceful, much more peaceful than societies later became. Uh, they were quite democratic as well. It's kind of a myth that primitive, so-called primitive peoples who live a simple way of life are less developed than modern civilized peoples. It's not true at all. In many ways, people who live simple tribal hunter-gatherer ways of life were and are uh, more developed, more democratic and more egalitarian than modern societies. But yeah, but with the ego explosion, things like patriarchy, hierarchy, warfare, monotheistic religion and so on, they all came into being as I explained in the fall. Michelle says, what do we do when family members won't even try to wake up and it looks like our children need to, need them to? Grandparents, aunties, older siblings. That's a tricky one because everybody is at a different stage of development. I used to struggle with this when I was younger, when I, you know, was with other, with members of my family and my parents and, and so forth. I would try to awaken them to some degree or try to influence them. But after a while, I just realized it's not really going to work because some people are just not at that point in their development. Nevertheless, I think you can gently influence people through your own being. I think it's much more productive to influence them gently through your presence rather than through any kind of conscious guidance or prompting. Because often when people are in an egoic mode, they resent your guidance and your prompting, and it makes them more defensive, makes them more stubborn. So I would suggest just gently influence them through 
your presence and through your altruism. And then that will bring them spiritual development. Oh, thank you, Laura. Um, here's a, a comment, not a question, but I too have tinnitus. And when it is particularly invasive, I say, this belongs, this too belongs. That's right. Yeah, that's acceptance. Yeah, that's similar to uh, my, um, my experience with tinnitus. Yeah, I find that if you, or if I accept the noise as part of my reality, it's part of my universe. I, saw, I used to think of it as a kind of fundamental sound of the universe, a bit like OM. And it is a fundamental sound in my universe. It's part of my awareness, part of my experience. So just being aware of it as a part of your reality, it belongs to your reality. Then that, you know, you're bringing an attitude of acceptance towards it, which takes away your resistance. It takes away the discord and duality, and it brings a sense of harmony. When we feel resistance to aspects of our lives, it creates discord because there is a duality between us and our predicament. There is a conflict there. So when we bring acceptance to that aspect of our lives, the conflict fades away and there's a feeling of harmony. The duality fades away and there's a sense of oneness. Next question is, would you define surrender and acceptance as being the same? Essentially, yeah. It depends on the situation, but sometimes surrender um, is more of a kind of, well, I was going to say active process, but in a sense, when you surrender, it's not active because you're not making any effort. In a sense, you're letting go of the effort. Effort always, sorry, resistance is always an effort. So you have to let go of the effort. You have to stand back and open yourself, which is, you know, uh, a good way of describing surrender. So essentially, they're, they're the same thing. There was one, um, one case of transformation through turmoil. That's what, I, that's what I call these moments when people transform in the midst of psychological turmoil. I call, them, I call it transformation through turmoil. There was one guy who he, he became disabled. He broke his spine in a fall when he was running one morning and slipped and landed on a rocky riverbed. And he was in a lot of pain, as you can imagine, and a lot of, um, a, a lot of bitterness because he'd lost, you know, he was in a wheelchair. He'd lost all of the activities he used to enjoy. You could no longer run. You could no longer make love. You can no longer be the father, be the active father he wanted to be to his son. So he was full of, he was full of bitterness and discord. Uh, but one morning, probably about 18 months after his accident, a nurse was taking him for a shower in his wheelchair. And he heard a voice inside his head saying, why are you holding on? What are you doing? Why don't you just let go? Just accept it. Just let go. And he just made a mental effort to, to release his resistance, to just open himself, to let go. And it was as if a barrier had fallen away. And suddenly this tremendous sense of well-being emerged like a like a river bursting through a dam inside him. And it seemed, seemed to fill his whole being and everything he looked at seemed to be filled, filled with a sense of well-being, the sense of bliss. And from that point onwards, he was never in a state of discord again. There was always this sense of well-being inside him. He said that whenever he felt pain, rather than taking morphine, which was recommended by his doctors, he would just drop into bliss, as he called it. He'd just let go and go down into his own being and feel the bliss of his true nature. And that would transcend his pain. So that's, uh, yeah, you could call that surrender. It's a, a letting go. Essentially, it's the same, of, the same as acceptance. Thanks, Tony, for that comment. Thanks, Ke Kerry. My eyes isn't too good, but I think Kerry. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Kerry. Eleonora. Oh, yeah, she just makes a comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Jeremy from Peep Show your brother? 
What a strange question. <laughs> Fortunately not. Do I look like him? I hope not. <laughs> That's fine, don't worry. Actually, he's a very funny guy and he's also a, a talented writer. So he could be my brother, <laughs> but he's not. Uh, Shelley says, have you noticed with your sense of presence and acceptance that people react openly to you? Has it made a difference? Yes, definitely, definitely. I've noticed that a lot. Even if they're not consciously aware of it, people always respond to openness and presence and acceptance. They sense it unconsciously and they're, they're, they're attracted to you and they sort of, they become open to you as well. They know intuitively that you don't have barriers. Often when you meet people, you can sense that there's some kind of barrier that they're not being authentic. There are some kind of defenses there. They're not willing to reveal their true nature. But if you live in presence and acceptance, people sense that those barriers are not present. So they feel at ease with you. They feel comfortable with you and they're willing to talk to you and share their issues with you. I guess um, the only issue it can cause is that um, sometimes so many people are attracted to you that you can kind of be overwhelmed by, by the issues that people bring towards you. So you have to be careful. You have to maintain your own well-being and make sure that you don't become overwhelmed. But it's nice. You know, it's nice that people are attracted to you and you can help them and they're willing to, to share their issues with you. David says, how to deal with the emotional side of acceptance. I have mysterious physical injuries that prevent me from doing a lot of what my heart would like to do career-wise. One day I could heal, but today is not that day is not today i'm struggling to accept this yeah this is um i think physical issues are one of the most difficult areas of acceptance but acceptance is key you know you, you have to accept that if you can't change something if you are not capable of healing today then you ha have to accept your new limitations and you have to embrace your new limitations. In every area of our lives where limitations occur, at first we can feel restricted because certain freedoms are taken away from us. Certain activities are taken away from us. But once we accept that we can't change that, then in limitations, new freedoms can express themselves. New freedoms can reveal themselves. I think that's, that's an experience a lot of people had during the, the lockdown, that certain freedoms that they took for granted were taken away. Life became very simple, very narrow. But within that narrowness, within that simplicity, new riches emerged. So I think that within the, the limitations that this condition, that these injuries have brought to your life, I think new riches can emerge within those limitations if you accept them. And if you bring your awareness into your new condition, the new conditions of your life. A uh, comment from Laura about tinnitus. Is there someone in your life who constantly annoys and irritates you? A person you don't want to listen to. Remove that person from your life and the tinnitus may get, go with them. And that's interesting. Hmm. I'll, I'll contemplate that. It could be useful. Thank you for that. Richard says, having read The Leap, I feel the only area that is lacking in my spiritual awakening is a feeling of oneness. Could you offer any advice on accelerating this or will it just happen naturally? There were lots of different aspects of spiritual awakening. As I remember in The Leap, I mentioned about 20 essential characteristics or qualities of spiritual awakening. And they are all interlinked. They usually emerge roughly in tandem with each other, but not always. You know, there, there are certain qualities which emerge more quickly than others, certain qualities which remain at a lower level of development. But gradually, the more you awaken, the more you develop, the more those qualities even themselves out. So I would suggest that, you know, if you, if you are patient, 
And if you don't worry about it, you know, just, just trust that this quality will emerge. It has to emerge because it's one of the fundamental qualities of spiritual awakening. So as you dream, generally move in the direction of awakening, then maybe that quality is just lagging behind a little bit because of your previous ex experiences, perhaps because of your personality traits, but it will eventually emerge. I'm certain of it. Uh, Joe Lanter says, um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. I've experienced it like a mini retreat. Oh, thanks. That's great. And Michelle, I think this is probably the last comment. How do we find people who intend to be awake? That's true. Yeah. Some people have slipped into a more egoic state, but I think all other people have also become more open and more awakened even during the the lockdown probably because as, as i mentioned earlier it's you know it's narrowed life down it's made life more simple it's made people aware of their priorities and what's precious in their lives um but people who, who intend to be awake i think we naturally gravitate towards people who are awakening or people who want to be awake it's mysterious and miraculous but we naturally gravitate towards these people and so i would just trust that you will be guided towards those people and they will emerge in your life. Can you teach acceptance to an eight-year-old eight, eight -year -old child? Hmm, that's a tricky one. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's tricky, it's tricky. But um, yeah, I think you can through example. You can teach through example. I, I, I sometimes say that children, young children, are a combination of enlightened spiritual teachers and narcissistic monsters. They've got both traits. So you need to encourage the, uh, the enlightened traits within your eight-year-old child and try to overcome the narcissistic monstrous tra traits. But yeah, I think um, an attitude of openness and patience and tolerance, but also firmness um, is very important with eight-year-old children. Having had three myself who've been through that stage, um, I, I sympathize with you. But if you set an example of presence if you share your spirituality with them and your calmness and patience and tolerance they will emerge from that stage um we're running out of time so maybe i'll just i'll just um deal with a couple more questions can you speak of acceptance in situations where it appears that we are being victimized um Mm, yeah, this is tricky, but th these, uh, these challenges often occur in our lives. And the most important thing is not to become full of resentment and bitterness due to these challenges. Sometimes it's helpful to, you know, to consider whether you can actually take action, whether you can actually bring change to these circumstances. If you can't change them, then you really have no choice but to accept them. But if you can bring action, that's important. But it's important not to take on the resentment and bitterness because that's self-defeating as well as the difficulties that these circumstances have caused. You also get the difficulty and the negativity and the pain of resentment and bitterness within you. So it's challenging, but you have to be self-effacing and imagine that almost as if these events are neutral events, which have happened. They're just events. They're negative. But you have to take action without being personally, egoically involved in it. And also it's helpful sometimes to consider the reasons for these actions. And to bring some understanding into the situation. Okay. Um, one last question then. Let's, uh, let's go to Trish. I'm wondering if the Eckhart Tolle teachings led to your first book, or had you already written your first book and he somehow became aware of your beautiful work? Um, actually, it's a long story, but my first book was called The Fall, which I mentioned earlier. Somebody asked me a question about it earlier. And my connection with Eckhart came because my book, The Fall, happened, in inverted commas, to be published on the same day as Eckhart's book, A New Worth, back in 2005. And I thought, that's a strange coincidence, the same day. 
So I decided to, it was a sign that I should send Eckhart my book. So I sent the book to his office. And in some ways, uh, The Fall and The New Earth, they're similar, which was another coincidence. They, they deal with similar subjects, like the, uh, the suffering caused by the ego in human history. So I just sent the book to his office with a little note. And about six months later, Eckhart called me. And um, they said, he sent me an email initially and said, I'd like to speak to you about your book. And he called me and he told me that he really loved the book and wanted to help me gain attention, wanted to help me promote the book and so forth. So that led to my connection with Eckhart. And um, that led to my connection with Vancouver. I came to Vancouver several years ago to meet up with Eckhart. And um, yeah, I'm deeply grateful to the support he's given me given me with my books. Thank you everybody for those questions and comments. Sorry if I didn't manage to get to your comment individually. Thank you, Steve Taylor. I, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that you can uh, purchase uh, all of his books, including The Clear Light and Extraordinary Awakenings from Banyan Books via banyan.com. And we'll send it out to you wherever you are. And um, I just wanted to say, Steve, uh, I would love to see your uh, wave poem as a picture book with illustrations. It would, I, I, it reminded me of like um, uh, Shel Silverstein, you know, some of his, uh, um, some of his books, they're, they're, they're written for children, but they're really grown up stories and uh, the, just with some line drawings or something. But yeah, um, yeah, a couple, a couple of people have mentioned that. Yeah, I think okay. it would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody's good at drawing, <laughs> send them in to see maybe collaborate. That'd yeah, good idea. Beautiful. But anyways, it was so so powerful, so profound. Uh, so thank you for sharing your wisdom with all of us today. It definitely made my morning, um, and uh, much to ponder. So uh, it's been an honor to host you, and um, hope to have you again sometime. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. Hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com. <laughs>